<laughs> it seems sort of cliche, but it's probably the easiest way to, to, to go through the story from, from uh, when you first met. And at some point, the three of you gelled and <clears throat> started playing together. I mean, would you like to talk about how, how that worked? Well, the, the real glue, I think, was the fourth member who's not here, is Anthony Phillips, who was kind of friendly with all of us. You know, Pete and I were sort of close friends. We were good friends, weren't we? Yes, we were. I'd like to say that. Um, and Ant and Mike were good friends. And Ant was a sort of friendly with Peter and I as well. He was in the same house and stuff. And he wanted to um, make a tape um, of some songs he'd written with Mike. And he invited me along to play keyboard. And I suggested that Pete came along and we did our songs. Well, we had one song we'd written, which we thought yeah. was quite good. And that's what we did. So we hustled our way into their session. <laughs> do, do you recall your, um, your, your sort of interest in music at that time? This is, this is uh, later in the 60s, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on out there. What, 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 what did you like? Well, I was uh, a pretty bad drummer. So stuff was rhythm, soul, um, and, you know, there was the whole R&B explosion in in England and uh, all, I mean, I think we were all Beatle fans um, as well as the, the soul music, but I mean, uh, Otis Redding was my hero at that time, I think. Your, your voice, um, what's it, is it fully developed? Um, my it balls have dropped, I think, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's what you mean. You have a great, yeah. really good, soulful voice right from the word go. I mean, you know, we used to, like Otis Redding and, and Nina Simone, I suppose, another one. You, you could mm. sound just like Nina Simone if you wanted to. And, um, and all those kind of guys. We used to listen to this on Benny King, Sammy, Sam and Dave and stuff. The, um, just this week, I've been working with this guitarist called Leo Nersantelli, but he was the guitarist on, um, uh, Lee Dorsey, uh, what's it, um, Oh, oh, brain has gone already. Um, working in a coal mine. Working in a coal mine. Working in a coal mine. Oh, right. Working in a coal mine, Get Out My Life Woman. Uh, but these were all songs that we were listening to at that time. God, he must be, must be quite old now, hasn't he? He's, he's only 68, I think. Oh, my God. But, so he was a young man at that I time. Know, I know, but Lee Dorsey sent, felt like an early yeah. generation, didn't it? Yeah. So, um, Mike, you're... You, you know, essentially, Team Gunn and Tim Richard initially. Um, how did it come that you finally met Peter and Tony? Were you in different houses? Yeah, I mean, I think, but I think, you know, school in those days, if you actually played an instrument or thought you could, you were sort of, there was a link, link you know what I mean? You sort of you felt akin to everyone else who did, I think. That's how I sort of felt it. And Ant, Ant was very much the leader with me, you know. Um, and uh, in fact, thinking about that session, that first session of Brian Roberts, you know, the, the alternative was actually was ant singing. So, all right. no wonder. Well, I, I have to out. say that, uh, I've been quoted saying this a few times, but, you know, he, he sang the first song because Peter had, had a, couldn't come for the first day or something. And I said, yeah, just, just why don't you wait till Pete comes, you know, it'll sound a bit better. And it did, I have to be honest. I mean, Ant's voice is about as good as mine. Which looks probably pretty good, of course, but not as good as it suits. It suits some things, yeah. though. It's, it's quite a thin voice, but you know, I remember, was it was Passady just instrumental, or was it, that was that had a melody? Vocal, didn't it? Yeah, and then you sang it. Let us now make love. Yeah. He had a few songs of a sort of, um, yeah, with the mm. uh, octave crossover hand feature. Yeah. Well, the theory was, is that, I mean, I always believe that anyone can find a way to sing. You know, without a good voice. Just, well, just that we never did, do we? Well, I, I couldn't, I couldn't it's a matter of a thing. Yeah, yeah, anyone can find I, a bad I, I believe so, too. Yeah. Yeah. You've, got, you've got to start, you've got to start, yeah. actually start young enough, actually, we've got to do it. Yeah, and I think in the studios now, you can cheat to such an extent that anybody's a singer, actually, to be honest. I mean, it's, singing is actually, funnily enough, sort of the easiest thing to actually produce a, a vocal on a record. The most difficult part of being a singer is that ability to project, I think, particularly on stage, which is something that some people have and some people don't. I mean, I mean, some of the most interesting voices of sort of Tom Waits, Randy Newman, Bob Dylan, you know, are not conventional um, good voices. In fact, I think 
um, Dylan's mother said, you know, he doesn't have to sing like that. You should have heard him sing with the choir. <laughs> you know, and it's, um, but they have a lot of character and they deliver words incredibly well. And I think that's something you try and learn is how to tell the story. We missed our chance. See, we hadn't even peed. We could have yeah, learned exactly. it. Funny we would have, have done it, yeah. <laughs> Probably yes. a good thing, actually. Did you, um, did, did, did you have a sense that once you three were together, that you were jelly, I mean, that this was the potential for uh, a group. Did you have any kind of sense in being just out there? It wasn't just a, a, a fad in school because it, you know, rock and roll was a... Reality. It wasn't Eureka. It wasn't quite Eureka, was it? I think it was, it was writing songs. We originally just wanted to, to other people to do the songs. Then we ever saw ourselves as performers, any of us actually, really. And, and Mike and Ant, who were keener on the idea of, uh, of playing live, and I think Peter and I originally just helped them out, was helping them out until they found replacements. I think that's yeah. how it looked. You know? and, it, and I think we were more set on being backroom boys and being the songwriters and less of the group. The Anom were more the sort of showy group. I think um, we were, I think, shyer also. So it was um, uh, coming at it from a different point. But there was an excitement about the songs. And like, you know, any young people who write stuff, um, we thought we were brilliant and uh, <laughs> were quite ready for the world to discover us. And of course, nobody at all wanted to cover our songs. So the only way of getting them out there was to do them ourselves. Um, you got in touch with John McCain, you were big man Yeah. And everything's gone to the moon, uh, the, the hit. Yeah. And uh, he's the old Carthusian. So um, now Jonathan said that he. You, you got him a tape. Well, we actually, we were too nervous to yeah. sort of give him a tape. So John we got Al. John Alexander, who was um, uh, always helpful. And, um, the lad. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And seemed um, a lot braver than we were. So he thrust it into his um, E-type, wasn't it? Yeah, actually, absolutely. He says it was a MG. MG, was it? Yeah, yeah. I think you're right, MG. <laughs> But it was it was very showy for the school at the time. And the reason we chose him really was because he was the only one. I must be honest, though, we didn't pick him out of all the people possibilities. It was either him or David Jacobs, his son, went, went to the school as well. Yeah. So he was an old, a backup. So was any contact uh, That's right. we were trying to exploit? But, uh, these were songs that you'd, you'd actually written yourself. So. Yeah. It was this first tape, this, which is six songs, five written by Anton Mike and one written by us. Pete and I, so it was... And the one you liked was the one... The one you liked life. was probably written by us. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's, Mike remembers that, <laughs> funny. Yeah. I think what he really liked was Pete's voice, actually, to be honest. I mean, that's the thing, you know, something, it's, you know, it's enough to make him interested to put money out for us making a series of tapes after that. Coffee. All right. Has he got sugar in it? Sugar? Thank you. Sugar? Uh, no, sweetie. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's, it's all right, it's sweet enough for me. It's honestly, I don't need sugar and coffee, actually, but yeah. other days I do. No, oh, right. It's a hospital. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> hospital coffee. Is that sort of good? It's not the best. We'll just carry on. Let's carry on with the coffees. It's all, it's free. Free, it's free form. Yeah. Yes, to buy stuff. Now, um, I just, uh, what I'm really interested in is the fact that this is, you didn't send him a tape of, of covers, you sent him a tape of something you'd written. Yeah. There was a sense in which you, as songwriters, were going to um, get this thing out there with a the guy who made a pop record, one hit pop. Were you thinking in those terms? Were you thinking, okay, what, this is what we need to do? need to get on to, you know, the top ten uh, singles. I think, I don't know if he had a column in Disco Music Echo, but he seemed like an entrepreneur as well. So there was this sense that, you know, the, if we could get him interested, there might be some doors that would open. And he was interested after this first um, 
So and and then we did the Silent Sun, is that right? And then the yeah, well, second tape after that. Well, no, we did a few tapes before that. We did a, we did the, right. the, the original tape which he liked, and then we did a series of tapes after that. Some of which he was he got less and less interested in a way. And then I think Peter and I reckoned that we didn't want to lose him because of our only contact. So the only for any time in our lives really, we sat down and constructed a song that we thought was right for the occasion a bit, which was the Silent Sun, you know, kind of very Bee Gees-ish, which was his favorite. He, yeah, he was obsessed with the Bee Gees, so we took, I, I tried my best Robin Gibb impersonation. And, um, and we, yeah, we wrote in, a, wrote a in the style of. Which is a song, in fact, in many ways could have been a hit in the period, you know, I think. Uh, fortunately for us, it wasn't, in a way. I mean, but, one of the things he stressed yesterday, very forcefully, was that uh, he knows, he said that he was obsessed with the Bee Gees, and uh, he liked to tell you that uh, what he was trying to do was to get him up to play more acoustic, uh, then you would listen to the instruments more, and then he was thinking more of Crosby, Stills and Nash. I think they were a reference yeah. to, yeah. Have they been done by then? They weren't up by then, were they? Probably still somewhere. I don't think they were out at that point. He might oh, have thought well, that's what he wanted. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. later got quite influenced by Crosby, Stills and Nash. We liked that acoustic, you know, um, effect and also the harmony work, although yeah. we weren't great singers, but we could sing in harmony. We had, you know, obviously had Peter and then later Phil. So it was, it was part of what we used to do. And then the birds with eight miles high. I mean, there were mm. just yeah. the harmonies on that were exquisite. Well, the Beatles were harmonies all the way through anyhow, you know, so. Yeah. But without that, I mean, without that first album, I'm not sure we'd ever, you know what I mean? It was a lucky moment mm. to get a chance to make a record, you know, in a school holiday sort of thing. It was you could, Good for us. Three days it took to make. No, it was a yeah. day and a half. Much nothing like as long as that. Yeah. I think we we had this, had the oh, studio. Three days. <sighs> was, is, it's in the book. It's of your book. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we just had 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 a thing. We worked throughout. We did actually sort of have a. Went back. Um, had, took three or four hours off in the middle of the night. You know, and went back and did the rest of it. It was it was. It was Denmark Street. What yeah, was the name Regent, of it? Regent Regent South. Regent B. Was we, wasn't it Region A we did the record? Was it? Oh, Region, oh, yeah. Region B was upstairs, was I think, the, the basement, yeah. But it was, uh, it was very exciting for us, Freddie. You yeah. Know? Um, and we, we were, you know, but the record, I think it was very happy with the arrangements that were later put on, um, string arrangements and stuff. It made it sound a bit sort of cheesy. I don't think they were as bad as all that. And kind of still loses sleep over it, but the rest of us, I think, are accommodated. Yeah. <laughs> well, we didn't have the power, really, to argue at that point. You know, I think... This was very much, Jonathan had this sort of uh, Beatles idea with the sort of black cover versus the white album, I think it just mm. come out. Um, and so he was sort of getting all entrepreneurial about it. And I think he pictured the strings adding sort of uh, a bit of sweetening to something that was a bit well, we'd, raw. We'd done The Silent Sun was done before all this, and we'd had strings on that. And to be honest, they sound quite good on that. And for what it is, it works well on that song. So we went that against the idea when it was suggested for the rest of the record, you know. Um, and then it's just, a lot of the time, it's just very, you know, we actually sort of, we did do write some of the parts, didn't we, actually? Um, they, but they weren't, you know, even so. But we, 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 we weren't in the mix. I mean, we didn't go to the control master. We weren't involved in the mixing, were we? That sort of thing. It wasn't no. sort of, we just did our bit, you know. He was, he ran the show, really. Yeah. But it was an interesting taste of what, what, you know, what could be happening, sort of thing. There was a few, a few nice songs on there, I think. What was the, um, the feeling when, uh, you know, I mean, it must have been, you know, a record comes out, you're still at school. I mean, you must have been flavor of the week at least amongst your friends, and what was it exciting? I remember one of the most exciting moments in my musical career was seeing an ad with our name in the record mirror, which I think they'd blagged some deal, um, and probably because record mirror was about to fold and no one read it, but, but actually <laughs> to see the, the, the letters spelling out Genesis, I remember with mm. great excitement. Do you remember where you were when you, heard, when you first heard it on the radio? Well, I remember Silent Sun. We were about, and yeah. a few uh, and yeah, think so kitchen. Was that. was that right? Yeah, which yeah. was exciting. But most of us, to be honest, uh, even by the time Silent Sun came out, um, we left school. We weren't there anymore. The first tape we had, obviously, while we were still at school, but so we weren't no longer quite in that sort of uh, in that area. But did we all leave the same year? Am I right? Sixty-seven, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, I think you might have stayed. I stayed an extra terms to the Oxford entrance or something. I think, but I can't remember. Um, yeah, I think it was, I remember. Uh, did you, so, leaving school, did you imagine that this was going to be it? Uh, you brought up a record, you were going to be in the, in the, in the 
the parade. I, th I think we had our moments of, of um, being quite convinced we were going to be pop superstars, but um, then reality kept on crashing in. <laughs> and, uh, I think buying the clothes, I felt pretty good. Remember yeah. Carnaby Street? Buying Carnaby Street. Yeah, that was... I bought the clothes for our first Top, top of the Pops appearance, which unfortunately never happened. <laughs> <laughs> we got the clothes, though. Clothes look all right. Yeah. It was... Um, um, yeah. Yeah, we were sort of, you know, we were very young. I mean, you know, Ad was only 15 or 16, I don't know, you know, 17 we were. So it was kind of like, um, it was very exciting for us. And yes, you thought that first moment, you thought, you know, we were going to happen. But I think very soon after that, I think we kind of thought, well, I certainly thought this was not going to be a career, but I would have loved it to have been. You know, I, I love music and to be able to do something in music just seemed like a fantasy. I think all of our parents were quite concerned that we weren't going to be able to um, earn a proper living and uh, Plan Bs were encouraged um, regularly at home. Sort of... Uh... Back. No, it wasn't. I mean, well, for me, it was film school. I actually had a place at this London School of Film Technique, which was in Shelton Street at the time. I think it's it's now. I don't know if it's the British Film School or something, but it was. So that uh, you had. University well, I was actually assessments. university. I went to university. I was there for, for a year. I mean, I left after a year to do this year of um, uh, this summer, at least of. of sort of helping Anton Mike out with the possibility of doing it. And at the end of that summer, you know, it was, I just, it was, I got a sort of feeling and excitement sometimes out of it that I thought, oh, you kind of got to give this a bit of a go, you know. And I think we both were kind of a bit iffy about it, but we sort of, sort of persuaded each other in a way, I think. Just, you couldn't bear the throw, you might lose that. I know, well, you said That's that. what you couldn't bear. I've said that before. Well, it's, it's, you said it before. It's actually. sort of true in a no, way. I mean, right, if the yeah. band had made it, you know, and I hadn't been in it, I would have probably been pretty upset. I have to say, but having said that, the, you know, it was, wasn't, you know, it was just a sort of feeling of, of this was something kind of, you had to see it through. And the university kind of let me take a year off. At the end of the year, we were going to reassess. We were all going to reassess, I think, was when we had this idea. And at the end of this year, of course, we got nowhere. <laughs> so. And actually, Jonathan Silver's parents won the day, and, and he went off with his tail between his legs to a college in... Uh, in America. Yeah. Cornell, I, yeah. I just Cornell. took another year off and then never gone back, so I'm still taking years off. I do have contact with them now. You're about to go back. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> what was the position with, with Jonathan King? I mean, he had some kind of a contract to deal with you. Though, there was, yeah, I think, you know, he um, took us along to Joe Roncaroni's office um, and they had a joint publishing venture and, you know, fairly typically we were being offered the record deal and the publishing contract um, and it was a very long deal and Jonathan, you know, we said, well, you sure this is all right? And, and he said, yeah, look, here's my contract. It's just the same as this one. <laughs> I signed this. It's all right. Go ahead and sign. And then, you know, we went back and, and uh, told mum and dad and, and they were thinking, would well, you sign contracts? And then they um, found some legal advice for us. And because we were all, I think, underage uh, for, um, I think, I don't know if it was 18 or 21 at that point, but the contract was then renegotiated with more reasonable terms and a shorter sentence. Well, it was originally sentence. five years with a five-year option. And that yes. would have, if you think about it, we signed that in 1967 or 68. That would have taken us right through, you know, well, right through the era with Peter and beyond, you know. Wasn't so some kind of the publishing thing. in perpetuity? Wasn't some of the publishing? Yes, some of the publishing yeah. was in perpetuity, which wasn't that uncommon. No, no. So, and the percentages were terrible, of course, as well, which is how it was in those days. So we managed to switch it to one year with a one-year option, which was yeah. fortunate. And what we sort of did with Jonathan King was we knew he didn't, Every time we tried to do something a little bit more ambitious, he didn't like it. We kind of knew that. So we sort of slowly just didn't send him anything and just drifted away. And he wouldn't have liked what we were trying to do, you know. When we did the album Trespass, which was made up of sort of songs of that period and other bits and pieces we had around at the time, which was in similar ilk, he, he wouldn't have followed that at all. He was a pop man, you know, and he was good at that. But he was not into the sort of, the idea of a sort of, 10-minute piece was not... Experimental or progressive, yeah. which was, you know, it was, was what was driving us. And I think there was an important time was this last period with Jonathan's, at, in Oxford, at Jonathan Silver's house, because 
although it was all acoustic, there were there was a thing called the movement. There were bits and pieces that appeared later, I think, in mm. stagnation and other things that were generated at that time. And it was, I think, a key moment for sensing what we could become um, musically. And we knew that that wasn't in line with what he saw for us or, or with his taste. Yeah, so. we, we were um, quite influenced by the bands who were trying to be a bit more experimental, obviously sort of late, later period Beatles and the Beach Boys from that period, but groups like Procol Harum and Fairport Convention, although they're a sort of folky group, was sort of a bit more than that, I think. Family were another group. For the very first time, we were listening to things in stereo, in headphones, in the Family's album, uh, which was Music in a Doll's House, I yeah. remember. Yeah, Family was the, and both of yeah, them. Yeah, was the first thing I'd ever heard in stereo like that, and it was, first I think stereo. it blew us Salty away. Salty Dog. Yeah, Richard, Richard McPhail's yeah. house is where I first heard it. He, he, had a, yeah. he was the first person to get stereo, and he played with the two Procol Harum albums um, and stuff, you know, Shine on Brightly and Salty Dog, and just the sound was just fantastic. Never having experienced that before, you know. So I think it was that was a... Things were changing very much. Late sixties, you know, suddenly the possibilities of music, you know, you didn't went tied to the pop song and the three chords, or how you were, and that was perfect for us because we we wanted to kind of do something else, you know.